I'm Paul Van Squike, your Taekwondo guide, and this is Topic Tuesday. And if you're new here, the concept is quite simple. People leave comments about Taekwondo, they ask questions, and we talk about it. It's all about the art that we love. The first question this week comes from Cindy Pearson, 6324, and it states, what are the best stretches for seniors when there's very limited flexibility in the back? Now, I'd be interested in diving into this more. My perception has been that when people say someone has a stiff back, it's actually their hips that are stiff. And what are we talking about where they can't lean forward and touch their toes or lean to the sides? These are usually issues with the hips rather than the back. So assuming that's the case, I would do all of the hip opening stretches that I recommend on this channel. You can check out those videos in my how-to section or you can go to my website tkdguide.com and do the free follow-along exercise routine that has a whole bunch of hip opening exercises. I think if you practice those hip opening exercises you'll get the results that you're looking for rather than trying to find time learning to stretch the back. Now I could be wrong, I don't know exactly what prompted this question, but generally my observation has been that when people think they have a, a tight back, it's the hips that are impeding them. From Daryl, 2023. Perhaps for next week's Topic Tuesday you could touch on demos. Speaking of which, does your dojang do a yearly demo? Have you found them to assist with enrollment. Is there any local parades or festivals that slot in and show martial arts in your area? Would this excite students these days or would they be busy? Would they be too busy to come to practice for a school demo team? Or would this excite anyone for that matter or spark interest for Taekwondo locally? Any stunt stories, opinions to share? That's a, a good question. I really think the world has changed dramatically on this. I started in 2003, which is already 21 years ago, and at that time, you know, we had the internet, but there really weren't any videos on the internet, and so what you got to see in regards to martial arts was really limited. I remember I would get uh, rent a video, a martial arts movie, and I'd slow it down frame by frame, even if it was a a VHS, I would <laughs> put it on this slow-mo feature that the VCR we had uh, had on it. And so I'd watch the techniques from the movies and try to figure out how these actors were performing them at such a high level. You could buy instructional DVDs, but they were expensive and they were high risk because you had no idea how good the person on the DVD actually was. All you could do was look at pictures of the covers and then try to guess. And a lot of them weren't that good. So you might drop $40 on a DVD, you get it, you pop it in, and it's someone who's not a whole lot better than you are. <laughs> so it was very challenging to see any kind of martial arts. And <clears throat> because of that, if I would go to tournaments that I knew had demonstrations before them, <clears throat> or if I ever saw a local demonstration, <clears throat> excuse me, been recovering from a cold for a few weeks here. Uh, it was always super interesting. It was exciting because you never knew what superhuman feat you might get to see. There was a mystery to it. And so uh, demonstrations were a big part of the dojang that I started in. They would run a yearly tournament and every year they would put together a demonstration for that tournament. Eventually I got onto that uh, process with them. It was pretty much something that you were expected to do as a black belt uh, in that case. In that case as well, I don't think it really helped with enrollment at all. It was more uh, something, something of interest for students to work on, something that they could sink their teeth into, make them feel like they were accomplishing a task. So there's a lot to be said for that. Point being, back then, I think there was a lot of merit to demonstrations. 
if you did them locally, it was going to be stuff that people didn't see on a regular basis and it might entice excitement and get enrollments. I don't know. I wasn't running a school at that time, but I can see how it would have been effective. And if fast forward to today, you can see the top level performers in the world, the touch of a button. <laughs> you can get top notch instructional content at the touch of a button for free. So YouTube and other online video players have really changed the game in terms of what people know about the art, what they expect to see. So, you know, I had someone come in for an intro lesson over the weekend who was uh, 14, and they said that one of the things that got them interested in studying the martial arts was videos on YouTube. So I don't think performing a local demonstration really much matters anymore because people will understand what you do if they're looking into it anyway. They'll, they'll see these things on the internet much more apparently and you can you can put your own content out there like I'm doing. Uh, you can put your stuff on your school's website. So is there a need for demonstrations for enrollment? I don't think so at all. Um, now the benefit I think is that it's good for students. A lot of people really enjoy participating in these demonstrations in, in building them and performing in them. I have three archetypes that you can you can follow to get to a, a black belt. That it's, it's like material you use for your black belt test. The warrior, which emphasizes sparring. The scholar, which emphasizes the curriculum material, something that like an instructor might go with. Or the performer, for these people who really enjoy learning flashy kicks and putting together skits and that kind of thing. It's, it's definitely a big part of the martial arts culture. So if you have the opportunity to do demonstrations, it can be good just in the sense of giving those types of students something to sink their teeth into. Now it's very time consuming and it's difficult if you're already focusing in, let's say, on competitions or really any other extracurricular inside, inside of, outside of your normal classes. If you've got one or two things going already, it's really hard to fit in demo team practice. But I do think it can be beneficial for students just to give them something exciting to work on. When you're talking business, um, I find the better thing to do is put yourself in situations where you can teach people something. So I will frequently go to schools and take young students through an introduction to Taekwondo. And it's interesting when they actually move and do the techniques themselves, there's an understanding immediately in how difficult the material is. Whereas if you're doing a demonstration, you can run into getting judged <laughs> rather harshly, uh, particularly depending on your crowd. So I like to take people through the material rather than show them what the material looks like so they immediately have a respect for what, what it is that you're doing so they can see how hard it is. And often when you do that, it immediately gets people excited to actually try classes because they're doing it and they go, wow, this is really fun. I like to learn this. This is something I feel like I can actually tackle and it's enjoyable. So that's what I like to do in favor of demonstrations whenever possible. Uh, then when it comes to events and that kind of thing, uh, the best thing you can do from a business standpoint, I, I think, is try to do events where you can get leads, actually get uh, people's names and numbers so that you can follow up with them and, and have them come in to do some, some classes with you. All right, next question from Huger1230. Hey, I know this is one year after and I don't know if you'll even answer. This was left on one of my technique videos. But when should you use the Taekwondo style kick, raising kick in a straight line ahead, then rotating the knee and kicking? And when should you use the Muay Thai style kick, kicking in an arc? Well, good question. Generally speaking, you use the Taekwondo kick when you're doing Taekwondo and you use the Muay Thai kick when you're doing Muay Thai. 
<laughs> no, I, I mean, what are they? What are the pros and cons of them? There's so many, obviously. Um, it's hard to concoct exact situations where one might be better than the other. What will happen is if you develop both of them, you develop a kicking intuition, and your intuition will understand the exact time and place where each might be beneficial. It's like when you're sparring, sometimes you throw a roundhouse kick at a 45 degree angle, sometimes you roll your hip all the way over. It varies depending on distance and a whole bunch of other factors that your brain has to calculate. Now, you can't do that with your conscious brain. There's too many calculations to make in a split second. It has to be intuitive. It has to be unconscious. So the point is that when you train the material regularly, when you make it unconscious, it will just happen intuitively. That's what you want from any technique. You don't want to stop, think, and figure out which one fits the situation exactly right in that exact moment. You want your brain to make an intuitive, instinctive decision there in that moment. Okay, just three questions this week. We had a whole bunch last week. Again, if you want to see this thing continue on, if you love Topic Tuesday, then please leave a comment. And that gives me more to talk about in our Topic Tuesday episodes. But that's all I have for you today, guys. Thanks, as always, for watching. And until next time, enjoy your training.